Sunday of the month, the Coptic month of Babel, and that on that particular Sunday we always read the gospel we just read. About. Mark chapter 2, the story of the four men that carried their friend to Jesus, and they did whatever they had to do to make sure that they get him to Jesus. So the question today is, are we for influential? You know what being influential is? We want to focus on, are we friend influential? This is, I was reading a very interesting presentation this week, and this is where I got this idea from. And I found it very pertinent to our situation as Christians in today's society, and as a church who has an obligation before God to make sure that we do our utmost to bring as many people to the Lord as possible. I don't know if you noticed today's reading from the Pauline Epistle. St. Paul says, we are the fragrance of Christ before those who are being saved and before those who are perishing. So we're the fragrance of Christ in front of everybody. Only God knows this end of everybody's life, eternity, but we have a role to play regardless of that. We're not here to judge who's being saved or who's perishing, but our role is to work out our own salvation with the Lord and to share that salvation with every person we can. And to really be a, a, a clean or free channel to let that fragrance of Christ emanate from Him through us unknowingly to those around us. So are we friend influential? Okay, so that's the question. So being, having friend influence or influence in Christ, to be a friend influential person is basically to on purpose seek people for Christ, to bring them to Him, and bring them to bring others to Him. So we're supposed to be that channel. I go out there by the grace of God, bring people to God, and after I brought them to God, I encourage them to also go out and bring people to God, and they do the same, and then they do the same, and it's just a non-stop till the kingdom of God comes, till the second coming. So what kind of friends are we? That's the question we want to ask. We have get-togethers. We get together for family birthdays, weddings, engagements, barbecues, uh, all kinds of outings. We go out together for dinner, for breakfast, for lunch, for coffee. We do tons of friend stuff with our friends. But what kind of friends are we? Are we a friend influential friend who's bringing each other to Christ and others to Christ? Or are we just living a social life, having our coffee, gossiping together about whoever and whatever, and moving on from day to day with no intentional purpose to bring somebody else to Christ today? We have to ask ourselves, this is a critical question, which we will be judged upon in the last day. So that's the scene of today's gospel. The Lord is inside a house, it's packed. Friends are determined to bring their friend to Christ. They get to the point where there's no way in, so they go from the roof into the house. So you look at the readings, it says, they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Now, it doesn't say this paralytic was carried by four bishops, a couple of priests, uh, a nun, a monk. It says four men. This is on purpose there to remind us that this is not strictly reserved for the clergy of the church to go out or to hopefully encourage souls to Christ. That's definitely the, their, their job and their responsibility that we, they will be judged on severely before God but it's also every single one of us's responsibility to the capacity that we can. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they had covered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Jesus looked at their faith and did the rest. We can't forgive people's sins. We're not God. He's God. But we can at least bring them to Him and let Him do the magic. Let Him do the stuff that we can't do. But at least let us introduce Him to them or do whatever our capacity allows us at that moment to most importantly pray for those around us every day, all the time. 
So why does this matter? So I found this very interesting. This is, a, maybe it's not 100% accurate, but it definitely applies very well, and it's, I would say, almost 100% correct. Out of 132 contacts of our Lord Jesus that he had with people during his three years on earth, six of, six of them were in the temple, four in the synagogue, and 122 were out with people in daily life. So the Lord himself did not spend all his day inside the synagogue and the temple talking to a bunch of people. He was out there talking to people. That's what he wants us to do. It's wonderful that we come to church. We need to come to church because this is where we fuel up to go back out there on Monday or Sunday afternoon to get back to work till next Sunday. Not just work, I'm not talking about 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. I'm talking about work for the kingdom of God. Something to think about, again, these are all very interesting points. The average Christian has few or no close relationships outside of their family or church members. Many Christians feel uncomfortable around people outside of that circle. The longer we are Christians, the fewer people we know outside of church circles. According to this article, it's very interesting. When you think about it, it kind of applies depending on how we look at our relationship with Jesus. Is our coming together as a church sort of like an exclusive club where a limited amount of people are welcome in and privileged to be part of? Or is it supposed to be more than that? Definitely, if we consider it a country club or some sort of place for the elite, we're definitely very erroneous in the way we think. What influences people to Christ? It says 2% is church ads. Church advertising, you know, especially in the States, you're driving down the road, God Jesus, or somebody's big church sign that says something about a verse or some sort. 2% of the influence the people to Christ comes from ads. Another 6% comes from the people serving inside the church. Whether it's the clergy or the Sunday school teachers or so on, 6% of influence of bringing people to Christ comes from that. Okay? Another 6% from organized evangelism programs. You know, like we have an evangelism class, we go do mission trips, churches do mission trips, all kinds of stuff. 6% comes of influence to Christ through that. Now check this one out. 86% of influence to Christ comes from friends and relatives. And it makes sense. 86% of the influence of bringing someone to Christ comes from that. It comes from me talking to my friends when we're at Starbucks, talking to my family over dinner, talking to my colleagues at work. This is where it comes from when I actually invite them to my house, my Bible study, my church, my whatever it is. That's where it all comes from. Somebody wrote something about their effect or how they were inspired or came to Christ. And they, they said this, you, you built a bridge of love between your heart and my heart and Jesus walked over. And that's where it begins. It has to be a bridge, a connection of love that actually, because of my love for Jesus and my care for Him and for what He's accomplished for me, I want to share that with others. Last night's song said, God be merciful to us and bless us Cause His face shine upon us and have mercy on us, that Your way may be known on earth, Your salvation among all nations. We're not asking God to be merciful to us and bless us and shine upon us just so that we can enjoy being in His presence for us. That'll be selfish. If I have something so amazing that I know about, I need to share it with others. We're often very good at, you know what, uh, this is a great restaurant down the road, you gotta try it, they have the best seafood. Oh, you got to try this place down, I don't know where, it's amazing. Oh, when you go to that town, you got to go to this place. We're very good at sharing information about stuff that we liked or we found good. How much more the Lord Jesus Himself? How much more? We shy away because of human fears and anxieties that are normal because we are only dust and we're human. But if we ask God to equip us and give us that grace, we'll gradually grow into that style of life. <coughs> so the urgency of the matter. The church must become intentional about saving others or about welcoming others, not just inside the four walls of the church, but 
talking to others, bringing others, welcoming others to Christ. If we don't do that, if we're not doing it on purpose, if it's just randomly, if it happens, good. If it doesn't happen, oh well. That's a problem and we're going to be very saddened by the result. Because we're going to see, you know, a vibrant church become just a decaying group of walls, you know, institutional walls. You know how so many people are complaining and talking about the church as an institution. And the church is just there, you know, it's a big, beautiful architectural uh, building, monument to something from the past. That's how many people live around us. We have to do something about that. We can't allow that to happen. If somebody else allowed it, we can't be part of that tide. We have to go against that tide. We can't say, well, we have a church. That's not going to cut it in the kingdom of God. So, three types of churches exist, more or less. This is one of them. I hope we're not the first two, but we're going to talk about them anyway, because I think we have a lot of work to do together. It's a collective effort, definitely. So, a family-focused church. The important relationships with our family. So, you know, my family, we come together as a family. It's all about my family. Granted, that's very important. But that's not enough. Attitude towards outsiders, closed. You know, the church is there. If they walk in, hmm, who's that coming today? Well, I've never seen them here before. Well, they don't know. They, they have no idea what we're doing. That's not how you do it. And we criticize them in our heads, and they read our eyes, and they walk right out. They make a U-turn 15, 20 seconds later. Attitude towards the lost, hostile. Or even more, if it's better than hostile, indifferent. Well, they're lost, what can we do? At least we're saved. We've got Christ, we're good, we're going to heaven, we have a special place reserved for us in front of the pearly gates, we're, we're, done. we're doing fine. That's a big problem. Again, that's not what Christ is expecting of us. Who initiates the relationship? People in the church. So we're family together. I, oh my God, it's good. Okay, so tonight dinner, all right. Tomorrow coffee, wonderful. See you on Wednesday for that. Yes, okay, great. Just, you know, a closed circle. Tight knit. Nobody can come into it ever. <coughs> Cliqueism, in other words. Very dangerous and very upsetting to the Lord Jesus Himself. Because that's not how He treated us by coming all the way down from heaven to save the world on a cross. He doesn't expect that, he expects way more from us. View of a priest in the church or the clergy, just like a chaplain. You know, you go to the hospital, there's a hospital chaplain, the prison chaplain, they're there in our office, we need them to pray for us, oh, your turn, okay, pray, okay, go back to your office. You know, a function, you know? They're hired to be part of an institution, their role is to pray, when it's time to pray, and then that's it, see you next week. View of the church. It's a building. Well, we have the most beautiful church in town. It's the tallest, the widest, the biggest. It's got the most gold. It's got the most, uh, I don't know what. This is a building. Growth experience in the church like that is either none or very small. So that's a family focused church. We really don't want to be like this. If we're anything like this, we have to pray fervently to change that. A friendly church. Friendly church. In more relationships, church friends. So I have my family, yes, but my friends. You know, I go to church with my friends. My friends from school, my friends from college, my friends from university, my friends from work, my friends, my long-time childhood friends that we grew up together since we came to Canada in the 60s or 70s. My friends, back and forth, that's it. Attitude towards outsiders is a little more open than the first one, but it's guarded. Mm, I'm not trusting this guy, he looks fishy. Something about the way he looks or how he's dressed or she's, I don't know. Out of the word, the lost concern. Yeah, well, we feel bad. We're concerned that there's a problem out there. But it ends there. Who initiates the relationship with the outsider? An outsider tries to come in. We, we try to, you know, get to know them and stuff, but it's, it's, it's guarded. It's not like open. View of the priest is an evangelist. The priest's job to tell us this and to do it himself. Or the clergy to do it themselves, or the servants, the Sunday school teachers. It's up to Sunday school, it's up to the priest, the bishop, the pope. The rest of us just come in, watch the show, and go home. View of the church, well, the church is us. You know, we're very, we love each other, we're a nice, nice, you know, kind of small, big family. We love each other, we're happy. 
Good. Growth experience mostly from transfer. So somebody's going to this church, they're tired of that church, they don't like what's going on there, they come to that church, and then when they're tired of that church, they go to this church, and after that church, okay, we're our last chance is this church. If that church doesn't work, we're going elsewhere. We're going to another country, another denomination, another religion, something like that. We don't want to be that one either. This is a church we want to aspire to be like and pray for every breath we have for till God comes back. A friend influential church. A church that, like we said before, on purpose looks for people for Christ, brings them to the utmost of their capacity as human beings to Christ, and after that's done, encourage them to bring others to Christ, and they continue, and we continue. And so on. Important relationships, eternal relationships. Everyone I look at, I'm thinking, I want to make sure that she gets to heaven. I want to see you in heaven. I want to see you in heaven. I don't want to be in heaven without you. I see you, I think of Jesus. I think of what He did for me and for you on the cross. I don't want you to miss out on that. I want you there with me. I want to get there. I want you to get there. I feel a burden on my heart if you're not there. I feel accountable before God if I don't help you get there. I'm worried about my own salvation if I didn't do my share to get you there. And so on. Attitude towards outsiders. Open. The doors are open. Please come in. But we're not going to stop at that. We're going to go look for you. We're going to invite you by putting ads in your doors and your mailboxes to come to an event or to join us for this. Or we're going to advertise about this. I'm going to try to talk to you at work and at school and at home. And attitude towards the loss. Concerned, like the first one, but active about it. We're taking a proactive approach to look for the fools who are lost or away from Jesus. Who initiates the relationships? People in church. So each one of like kind of the other one, but it's different. Because the people in church are not just, you know, congregating within and among themselves. But they're agreeing, okay, who are we going to go visit this week? Who are we going to check up on this week? Who are we going to call this week? Who are we going to go and meet this week? Who hasn't been here for a while? Who do I know at work that has been very reluctant to follow Jesus? Or was with Christ and left Him? Or the list goes on and on. View of the priest is just an equipper. The priest is there to equip us, inspire us, strengthen us, advise us, counsel us. He's basically kind of like our friend, part of the team, working with us to make this happen. He's just an equipper. He's not a chaplain. He's not there to pray for us and go home. He's not just there to be the one to do all the work and the rest of us don't do it. We're working with him, together, all of us as a team, to achieve this duty. View of the church. Church is the body of Christ means everybody on earth is meant to be part of that body. Growth experience new growth. There's supposed to be new faces regularly. New baptisms frequently. Every, every while you walk, somebody else got baptized. That's good. Does it end there though? We're going to talk about that too. So this is the kind of church we need to aspire to be like. We want to get to this point. This acronym applies to us very much. This is another thing we need to aspire to. A vital church. V for vision. We have to have a vision. King Solomon writes in Proverbs, when the people have no vision, when there is no vision, the people perish. We perish. There has to be a vision. Our vision needs to be everyone I know, I will do my utmost in prayer and whatever I can do to make sure that they get to Christ. Just like those four men made sure that their paralyzed friend got to Jesus. No matter what it took, you can imagine how stressful it must have been to carry dead weight on a stretcher through tight alleyways, getting insulted, laughed at. The guy himself screaming, what are you doing? I don't want to get hurt. Bringing him on top of a roof where he could fall and die. Getting yelled at and getting threats of being sued or calling the police because I'm breaking through the roof to get him into Jesus. You can imagine the obstacles they had to face to make this happen. We have to face obstacles. We can't expect that, well, I'm going to talk to them about Jesus today, they're going to become saints tomorrow. I myself am not a saint yet, right? We all, we're still working on ourselves. So we can't expect it, it's going to be that easy. It's not going to be that easy. Inspirational worship. This is crucial. When we come into this church, or any church for that matter, whether we're deacons, whether we're congregation, whether we're the priest, whoever, if listening to the tune or the melody, or watching the time go by, that's not inspirational worship. When the church has got a couple of people singing or praying or praising, and everybody else is waiting for this to end, 
That's not inspirational worship. That's the most boring thing ever. People walk in and think, what is this? When communion is being given out and people are talking and, oh, hi, it's so good to see you again. That's not the time for the highs. It's not the time. The time is to focus on Jesus. The gospel is being read. People are talking amongst themselves. The gospel. Or during whatever part of the ceremony, somebody's passing out something to someone. Food. I don't know what. Things like that are unacceptable. When it's time for prayer, it's time for prayer. Nothing else. The roof could cave in. It's not time for fixing the roof. We need to pray from our heart on purpose. That's what makes the prayer inspirational. That's what makes people walk in and feel, wow, I felt something today. I felt the Holy Spirit touch my heart somehow today. That's what we need to aspire towards. So when we're praying, we need to pray from our hearts, not just from our tongues, or not just take a break when we get tired. It has to be purposeful. Training and discipleship. We need to, you know, pass on this message to everybody around us. The church gives training to pre-service class, there's catechism class, there's different meetings, there's different groups. All this is meant to disciple people to do this. Authentic community. We need to be real, together and with others. When between us, there is arguments and anger, or, or animosity, or I don't want to talk to her again or him again, that kills the community. When the community transforms to a, a gossip, arena. We've destroyed the church with our bare hands and tongues. Serious, serious problem. Loving outreach. True outreach, true love for the souls of those coming in and going out <coughs> and back and forth and out there in this neighborhood, that neighborhood, to the ends of the earth. See, well, it's easier said than done. I know it's easier said than done. I'm not saying this because I'm the master of this. I'm saying this because we need to do this. Our salvation and those of others is on the line because of this. Look at St. Paul here. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. He was provoked when he saw people are worshiping idols rather than Jesus. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentile worshippers. So he reasoned with them in the synagogue and in the marketplace daily. Those who have to be there. So not just like Jesus, not just inside the temple or the synagogue, also in the marketplace, everywhere. How do we do this? My activities, my work, my hobbies, <coughs> I should use these as a tool. I play hockey Sunday night, great. What are you doing while you're playing hockey? When you're sitting on the bench, before the game, in the, while you're dressing up, after the game, when you're going out for coffee. Is there any mention of your faith? Is there anything that makes people wonder and ask you, you seem different, what are you exactly? What are you doing? My workplace. We have staff rooms in all our offices, in all our workplaces, and we meet people, we talk, we eat, we joke, we laugh, we tweet. But is there any mention of Jesus ever? Ever. Again, you say, well, I can't talk about Jesus in this one. I don't know your context, you know your context, but there's something that can be done. At least silent preaching, your actions, your words, your prayers. <coughs> Church, backyard barbecue, we can do stuff. Doing a barbecue in the summer, right? We have a movie night, stuff like that. We, there's how we do this little things like that constantly. Pass the line, invite people over for dinner, a church or at home or in a community center. Fall activities, we take the season and make something out of it. We find out the, the calendar, okay, it's, you know, Black History Month. We do something about Black History, for example. Visit colleagues in the hospital or at home, see how we can, how and if we could be of help. There might be people that we, a colleague of mine is in the hospital. Was it, I found out from the human resources, oh, he's on sick leave for three weeks. I will send a Hallmark card, wonderful. But more than the Hallmark card in the mail, going over ourselves and visiting has a bigger impact. So be a Christian friend. F4, find ways to build bridges. If, we're, if we ask God fervently, He's going to give us the creativity to find the ways that work with any of the others. Reach out. Involve yourself through prayer and participation. Participate with people. Pray for them fervently. Get involved. Don't just come to church and walk out. You must get involved in the church and out. Extend an invitation. Why don't you come? We're having Fall Fun Fair October 31st. Why don't you bring your kids? There's going to be tons of chocolate and candy. 
fight them. And then I'll pass up an opportunity. There's a chance to say something. If you can't preach, say something, do something. We're in a country that still can allow us the freedom of religion. Let's not waste that privilege. It might go away one day. Disciple others. Disciple others. Bridges. B for boldness to reach across barriers. R for responsiveness to their needs. Being responsive. There's needs out there. Let's be responsive. Integrity in our walk with Christ. Determination to never give up on reaching others. Be determined to do it. Grace to understand how and why they live the way they live, rather than judging people because of they're doing something other than what we think is right. At least to and understand and work with them so we can help them out. Empathy to identify with our spiritual situation and sincerity. Be sincere that we really do care. These are things we need to pray for. I mean, these acronyms that this person came up with are amazing. But we need to not just think about good acronyms from this person. We need to see how we can apply it. So it's an ongoing process. Like it's not enough for us to say, oh, a new person has come into the church. We want another person to Christ. That's not enough. We need to help them grow their faith. We need to continue growing together with them. So they will know we are Christians by our love. So again, we have to ask ourselves, are we portraying Christian love? Are we living the Christian love? This is, again, something that is not just, it's easier to say, but to apply it takes daily work. A daily work, daily effort. There's plenty of excuses that we can give ourselves why we can't have this happen. There's excuses to the left and to the right all day long. But there's the way to Christ, the straight way, there's no excuses. I don't make myself excuses. I don't allow myself to justify myself by an excuse. I ask the Lord, help me to do whatever I can do in my little capacity. And the rest is up to you. The four men knew that they could not heal their paralytic friend. They could not do anything other than just bring him to the feet of Christ and to let him do the rest. Same thing for us. So this is somewhere to end with, something to think about. The church has left the building. We've, we've talked about this once before. We really need to take the church with us out there. Leave with it, pass it on as far and as wide as we can. May God give us this, this determination, this grace. And glory be to God forever.